last Sunday, I um, had the, the honor, the privilege of, of doing one of the readings at the Lafayette Master Chorale. Uh, Gail and, and John are, are a couple of the board members, and we have several church members who, who are, are members of the Chorale. And um, for, this, for the second year, I got asked to do one of those readings. It was kind of like a lesson in carols. Their, their season was um, enduring elements, and it was a celebration of many things, but one of them was just being able to sing without masks, right? And it was an amazing, it was an amazing um, choral and, uh, and musical event. There was, there was a brass quintet and tippany and uh, a youth choir and a children's choir and, and then the master choral and it was, it was just glorious. If, if you're a Facebook friend of Gail, you can see all the highlights on, on her page. And I don't remember the, the reading I got last year. I think I might have done kind of like one of the closing prayers or something. And, and, and John sent me the, the text and then he sent me, and I, I, I switched it. And I think he um, kind of was putting his thumb on the scale to give his pastor one of the best readings. Because it was the one that we just read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I, I confess that, that I, I did my best to, to read it dramatically and oratorily homilytically, whatever, and I still didn't do as good a job as Karen just did. But it, it, it made me think about this text and how much I love it and how much I don't know about it. Have you listened to this text every Christmas? And it's, it, it's one of two that, that were offered on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and inevitably on Christmas Eve, we will default to Luke 2. It's a beautiful birth story. The story of the taxation, the census, the travel, the lodging that was not to be found, the birth in the stable or the cave, which actually we think really is probably the more accurate Description and these shepherds in the star. And then our lectionary providers, if, we, if you follow the lectionary, will, will suggest then that you read John 1 as the alternate text on Christmas Day. And unless Christmas falls on a Sunday like it does today, we usually don't show up to church, right? What are we going to do next year? Christmas. Eve will be on a Sunday. I, I should take a poll right now. Are you going to come both at 9, 11, and 7? Ponder that. We might be asking you later. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word... See, I got that in the wrong order. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a big theological assertion. It is the very foundation, the essence of, of who God is. It is the foundational statement that the church centuries later would, would go to battles over. Was Jesus God? Was the Holy Spirit part of God? These, these Jesus wars that happened as, the, as this movement centuries later would all revolve around some of the centrality that John lays out in this very intricate, sophisticated, theological statement. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is the Word? It's not what is the Word, who is the Word? The Word is Jesus. In Greek, we say logos. Logos. The Word is Jesus. I've, I've, I've used this text before, and 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 and. and what, what feels like almost blasphemy in, the, in this kind of reorientation of, of Christianity in our culture and, and some of the ways that we've kind of entrenched the, the, the conversations about what is 
what it means to be a Christian in the United States and belief and, and, and where the Bible's placed. And, and, and the, the word is the Bible so much that, that, that we, we use language around that. And the word is not the Bible. The word is Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. John goes on to talk a little bit more about sort of the conversation that the community was having and trying to understand that there was a man sent from God whose name was John who came to be a witness to testify to the light. The light is Jesus. They were trying to figure out who, well, which one of these fellows was going to be the Messiah. And then John goes on to talk about how the world, how the community received this man that John was saying was sent from God and always was a part of God. And then to explain how it happened, John says, and the word, Jesus, became flesh and lived among us. The word, Jesus, who is God, who was with God and is God, came and dwelt among us. Or I like how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message, and moved into the neighborhood. It's interesting when you, when you pay attention to what... John is trying to do, and, 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 you, and you look a little bit about some of the assertions that, that John makes, not just here in this very first chapter of the fourth gospel, but also throughout, throughout the arc of, of John's storytelling, which is so different from our three synoptic gospels. I mean, we don't have to just look at the beginning to see how John does not tell the same story that Luke and Matthew do, even though Luke and Matthew have, have, have different emphases. Is that a word? And, and, and Mark begins right there at Jesus' baptism and straight on into the ministry. But John starts in a whole different place. John doesn't start with Jesus' birth. John goes back even farther. John goes to the foundation of of time. John is going back to Genesis and saying, when God created everything, Jesus was already there. John is hearkening back to everything coming together as he understood it and how the community was trying to understand God and putting it together with with, with, with this, this emerging theology around a Jewish community and a Gentile world that they lived in, and the paradoxes that existed within all of those things. Because even in that moment, just as we struggle with this now, that we could see there is both unity and disunity in some of these ideas. What came into being was brought into being through him. Jesus, beloved, in the world, God with skin on, coming into our domain. And yet, John points to the disunity that exists. Light shines in the darkness, the darkness does not overcome it, but the darkness is there. It is this push and pull between what we see about God becoming God and us understanding God is this all-powerful thing and yet coming into this space where there is still all this stuff, this bad stuff that happens. How does that all fit together? Marianne Mai Thompson says, the calling that calling Jesus God's word means that he is God's self-expression, God's mind, God's thought. It is God's interiority spoken aloud. Word. 
Jesus is not only the representative of God, he is the representation of God. I sometimes th think back to um, my seminary days and, 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 and those, and, and for me, who it wasn't as long ago being a second career pastor kind of guy, I'm like, sorry, Glenn, you're here, so I get to pick on you, right? Who has been in this a, a lot longer. So, so, so remember back, right, when you had to write all those papers for your ordination, right, and, and you had to name those things that were your theology and to make sure that they aligned with sort of the, the church welcoming you in because, you know, once you're in this gig, it's a lifetime thing. And, and I remember like, well, first I, I know what they want me to say. And then I know what I want to say. And you, you put all those things together. Because I, I know that in, in my mind, I, I, I sort of had this, this acknowledgement of, of, of this wide place that we as Methodists are in. And, and, and there are those folks that sort of um, I, I want to kind of hold on to, oh, how do I say this, kind of sometimes a little bit of a narrowness around our, our orthodoxy that need to hear a certain thing. And those that will al allow us a little bit more of an expansive posture. Those of us who acknowledge that we live in a pretty complicated world and where does that, that theology fit in? Because, because, because we know that there are going to be places in different communities where, where, where you're going to have to navigate people with this whole wide spectrum of understandings about who God is and find ways to have language to talk about those. And I, and I won't get into every one of those sort of, sort of deep and, 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 and sticky potholes that one can get into with, with our theology, especially with with our connection as United Methodists, because we'd be here all day. But I remember thinking about, you know, how, how do I describe this language of Jesus? And, and, and what, what worked for me and, and, and what suited me was that Jesus is that best expression and the one that God sent. Because we, we had been on this trajectory since Genesis, right? And, and, I, and I can acknowledge, and if you're not with me on this, it's okay, but I can acknowledge that, the, that this, this Genesis epic, this, this creation myth story, right, is not a literal thing. I went to college. And I know that, and I know that, that, that our scientific minds are, 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 are ever learning things. You know, last week, Corey preached about string theory, and, and he said that, you know, remember when you went to science class and, 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 and you, you learned about atoms and quarks, and I'm like, wait a minute, they didn't have quarks when I was in science class. I'm that old. It wasn't one of the things that we measured. You know, our mind, and, you know, just this week, we heard about, we heard about the, the, the new photographs that are coming back from the, the, from the new big telescope. What's the name of that telescope again? I, the Webb Telescope, that's right. It's, it's, it's massive. It's this big gold telescope that, that, that just puts the old Hubble to shame. Right? And we have this God of this cosmos, which we are learning more and more about. And where do our ancient stories fit into all of those? Do you struggle with this? Do any of you struggle with this, or is this just me? John did too. The John community did too. I, I, I use John for a shorthand. We, we know that our, our Gospels really were, were, were stories that were passed along to communities, written decades after the human Jesus walked on this earth, and, 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 and they were working out their own theology as well. And one of the things that we know about John's community is that it was, well, for one thing, our, 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 our biblical scholars will tell us that John is the latest of the four Gospels written, probably somewhere between 90 and 110, right? Right? Our, our uh, 
Mark is believed to be the, the first written right around the burning of the temple in the year A.D. 70. And then Matthew and Luke probably pretty emerged pretty close together in, in that timeline a couple decades later, maybe in, in the 80s. And then John emerges at least a decade or two later. So, so you think, look how much our world has changed in 20 years. Somebody was telling me last night that, that they couldn't... Um, uh, they couldn't watch our live stream. They wanted to, but their, but their computer was, was, was too old. It was from about 2000. Corey and I were standing there. Do you remember your computer in 2000? The world moves quickly. Thought changes. And what we, what we know is that John's community, it, I, I think this is one of the reasons why John's, John's theology is a, a, a little more sophisticated because they have had more time to sort of put all this stuff together. And like, who is Jesus? And we also see some some movement in in, in some divergence of the original Jewish community that that formed, that was this cradle that that Jesus' life lived within and emerged from, and it is kind of moving away from different streams, especially as we think about the context ever. Remember I said Mark? Is, is, is put together and kind of put out there when 70, which ha- is the, what happens? Burning of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, right? So the community, the heart of the community has fallen apart. Judaism itself is changing in this period. And it's, and, 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 and they're, they're refiguring out what it means to be a community. Where do they worship? We are, we're still under this whole umbrella of, of, of a Greco-Roman empire, just last night we read about censuses and governors and kind of pulling the strings of a community that is, does not have a lot of control. And, and, and this continues to exist. In fact, it continues to exist until the third century when Christianity finally does become the religion of the state. Now that creates a whole new can of worms, folks. But John's community is trying to figure this out, and they're inviting others into it. And these others that they're inviting into it are not just Jewish folks. John's community is reaching out. They're multicultural. They recognize that there's a, a wider world around them, and they have something to share and to offer. And some of those are the, what we call the Greek community, but I would say the Gentile community. And so this this logos is important because of that. Because what John is trying to do is pull together this theology from the Greco-Roman world, the way that they think, the way that they argue, the rhetoric of the day, wrapped in the theology of Christology, the Christ, this new movement of being Jesus followers. And so, logos, word, the same root word for logos is logic. They're trying to make this logical argument and fit all this together. And yet now, 2,000 plus years later, even that feels insufficient. We, we, we can say that Jesus is God. Jesus has been there from the beginning. We can debate the trajectory of and the acceptance of the orthodoxy of the Trinity. But what exists still, because we have... We have whole swaths of people. We have whole communities that this is still not sufficient for. Some of those representatives are defying those odds and sitting here today, and that's you young folks. The young folks are are leaving the, the church in droves because there's an insufficiency to the trajectory of our willingness to continue to let the story unfold 
that, we're, that, we're, that, that we seem stuck in, 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 in this singular understanding. And yet, this very argument that John lays out in John 1 is an argument for an expansiveness to who God is and to what God does. And it acknowledges that there is disunity even in the unity and even though that Jesus is that best expression of God's self because Jesus is God's self as that theology wraps itself in that we have to do something with that And on this day, when it would be easy to read John 1, 1 to 14, as this beautiful word progression, and to remember last night when we read Luke 2, 1 to 19, I cut off 20, I want to end it with, and she treasured the words in her heart. We read the story of the angels and the shepherds and kings and governors and stars. To let that reside in some compartmentalized place. And that our, our lives in the world and our, the things that we do outside of Sunday stand apart from all those things. But in my mind, this is how the logic works for me. That if Jesus was God, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus moves into our neighborhood and becomes flesh, and we take that theology and, 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 and we, we let Paul have his, his hand in it and, and, and create some new ways for us to think about it and remind us that we are, we are the body of Christ together. And you couple all those equivalences, and, and for those of you who are math folks, I'm not sure, or logic folks, if they will all equally agree, but I'm going to say that there is a, a logic stream there. It is a reminder that that divinity is something that is incorporated into us. And that that's the essence of this, this theological idea, imago Dei, the image of God, the one that we believe is in everyone. And that informs everything that we do. That informs the ways that we welcome people. It informs the ways that we think about our relationships with others. And it certainly informs the way that we think about God but it also reminds us that Jesus showed us the way to act in unity even in the midst of our disunity. And I think about this story that was really kind of part of one of my early ministry settings. Uh, um, at, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, I, I, I'm second career. I, I came into ministry when, when my, my children were in, in, in elementary school and kind of did the whole seminary and working in the church thing. And, and after that process of kind of going through all, jumping through all those flaming United Methodist hoops and being commissioned and, and being sent to a church, being sent to my first, first church and, and flying solo and trying to figure out what, what all that did and like, where does all this work together? And, and you're the one that you're asked to lead. And it reminded me of this Christmas story. The, the church that I served was, was a church in sort of the, the, the center city of, of, of the Kokomo area. And, and it, the church itself was located in just kind of south of the, of, of the main downtown area. And it was, a, it was a place that, like a lot of communities, even though Kokomo was much smaller, you know, the center of the city's had, had sort of been um, 
it dwindled away as people had kind of moved to the perimeters and you know they wanted bigger houses and and bigger yards and all those other things and the church was surrounded by a lot of folks that struggled and they responded and they stayed in that place and they ministered and they were just this wonderful, big-hearted congregation. Their hearts were big, their numbers were small and getting smaller. And yet, week after week, they showed up for the community that showed up. One of the things that happened was, was I started in 2015, and it, it was a number of years after sort of that big downturn of our economy in 2007, 2008, and there was a lot of community programs that had been started as a response to that. And, 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 and Kokomo had been hit particularly hard simply because of the, its industrial base. Of course, most folks know that it was kind of a car-building town, and um, a lot revolved around... Uh, Chrysler and General Motors and different subsidiaries that, that, and the town literally had shrunk to half of its size in, in less than a decade. It had gone from, from over 110,000 people to about 56,000 by the time I got there. And of course, we know what happens when, when those numbers shrink. Those that, that have employment and economy go to the places where that is, and those who don't stay behind. We had a lot of expressions of that. And I remember th this, this one person who, who, who would come in to the, to, the, to the church a lot. And um, I'm going to call her Kelly. And we, we, we had a way to, to, to respond to, um, we had a, a missional fund. In fact, it was a really generous missional fund for, for the size of the church that we are. It was, it was a quite a generous mission budget. <clears throat> and I, and, and I, uh, I walk in the door and they say, okay, pastor, here's, here's your pastor's fund. You've got to figure this out when people walk in. And I'm like, what? It was the biggest gift that I was ever given. And in some ways, one that I miss a lot. It was, it was hard stuff. It was hard stuff for someone to sort of come. And, 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 and we talked about this a couple Sundays ago in, in, in our Sunday school class, sort of about that, that, that push and pull of, of kind of like where, where our lives are in response to, or to, uh, um, you know, to, the, to the challenge of, of, of poverty and, um, and so much that's sort of wrapped up in that. But one of the things that I had, had, had learned and, and brought with me sort of in my formation was, was ways to, to, to try to honor people, but also to see what was essential, that what, what could be done, and, and to speak to some of that, that push and pull between um, kind of that one directional charity that really doesn't, doesn't really do anything except, except sort of put a band-aid on something at the moment? How do we, how do we sort of change the way that we, we, we value people and, and, and let them see their own dignity and, and um, gifts in themselves? And, and, and so often my response was not to, to simply kind of like look at the utility bill or, or whatever that was, but say, is there something that, that you have to give that will, that will both allow us to be in relationship together and to help you kind of see something and sometimes that what meant asking them to do something for somebody else. It wasn't something for the church, you know, um, but really something that built up the larger community. I would, I would ask, you know, what are, your, what are your gifts and your talents? But sometimes it was like, you, you just, you've just got to throw money at it because... There's, there's health at stake, and this was one of those times. And so, so, so Kelly uh, uh, was in this really difficult spot. She, she, she had a health condition that, in, in my mind, legitimately qualified her for disability, and yet over and over those disability claims would, would be rejected, and she 
continued to, to pursue that, but was in a place where she, she literally could not work because of the, of the health condition that, that she had. And she, she would come and she'd, she'd like want to help out around the church, and she was wonderful. And, and, and her, she said her, her gift was like making things better, be better, look better. She, she enjoyed um, um, you know, working in people's homes, cleaning houses, and, and all those things, but just, but just had limitations to how much she could do. And she would just come to the church and, and to do that. And so, you know, she's like, I don't want anything in return. I just kind of want to help out. And, and she became this beloved person in our lives. But there was this, this one time when she said, I need a copay for this medicine and I don't have it. And, and I said, yes, I mean, you need this, right? And and we we dipped into the missional fund, and and I, I she didn't drive, so I I gave her a lift to the to the drugstore where she was going to pick it up. And um, as I'm walking out the door, my my church secretary hands me an envelope and said, "Give this to Kelly." I'm like, what, "What's this?" And <clears throat> I. I get in the car and um, we go and, and get this done and, and then um, I after she did it I said Marcia told me to give this to you and, and she opens it up and in it was a couple hundred dollars and I kind of like what was that all about and, and she just breaks down because this is this is only days before Christmas she says now my family can have Christmas that in itself was was a, a beautiful thing that I had the privilege of being a witness to and I go back to the church and I say to Marsha I said what was that and she said another church member came in and she just felt, because it's Christmas, that there was somebody who needed it. She didn't know who it was, but knew that we would know who it was. And she gave it to me, and I gave it to you, and you gave it to Kelly. The systems had failed Kelly. And yet, God did not. And the community did not because of this mystery of who God is. And that Christ-like impulse and behavior of, of, of that little church, that dwindling church in the center city community, that still was following that example of Christ, following that star of Bethlehem, if you will. But in the disunity, God invites unity, and God showed us what that unity is like in Jesus Christ. And the mystery of the incarnation is still a mystery to me. And that's okay. Because what I do have is a story. A story of a birth, a story of a star, a story of people who were struggling to figure it out, people who offered me their ideas and their ways, now more than 2,000 years ago, and have allowed me the same latitude and opportunity and invitation to figure it out too. That in the beginning was good. And that good was God and that good was with God. And that good came to earth wrapped up and looking like one of us. and invites us to be good and to feel good and to embody good 
be light, be love. Like that. And today, that's all I need to know. Amen.